Heavenly Father, thank you for today, and uh, thank you for the chance to be together to study your word. We're so grateful, Father, for your son Jesus, for his love, for the way that he lives so that we can live eternally. Now, as we study your word together, we pray that your spirit would be upon us and in us and lead us into truth. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. A couple of years ago, my wife Melody and I, we took an early morning trip to the city of New Braunfels uh, to go run in a race. Now, um, the two of us actually like to run quite a bit, and so we've run many races before. On Thanksgiving morning, there's a race called the Great Turkey Challenge. We've run that before. That benefits the San Antonio Food Bank. Uh, we've run the Wounded Warrior Run up at the rim. Proceeds go to support our brave men and women who've made great sacrifices in battle. Uh, Melody, a couple of times, she's run a race called the Rock and Roll Marathon, which is a race that is huge here in San Antonio, but not only in San Antonio, it is big all over the country. People come in from all over the country just to run in this race. But the race that Melody and I drove to New Braunfels for was really kind of a, a very special race for us. It held a special place in our hearts. It was a half marathon called the Chosen Race. And it was for families who are adopting. It's kind of like a giant support network. It's run by a Christian organization, and the idea behind the chosen race is this. God has chosen us to be his children through his son, Jesus Christ, and with adoption, we have the chance to make children our own as well. And so it was a very special race for us because Melody and I, at the time, were in the throes of the adoption process. And I can remember when we were driving to New Braunfels, we were very excited about being able to be a part of this race. I can remember how excited we were to be able to run this race. Actually, Melody was really excited to be able to run this race because this was a half marathon. I will run a 5K. You're not going to get me to run 13.2 miles. I'm sorry. It's just not going to happen. And so while Melody was running the race, I was cheering her on with lots of chili dogs just to make sure I didn't get too famished while I was cheering her on. Actually, I, I did some volunteer work for the race, and it was something that was very special to us. Because, of course, adoption is something that has affected our lives exponentially for the better. The chosen race, it was kind of our cause. You know, I was thinking about this. Most people have a cause, most people have something that is really near and dear to their hearts that they commit themselves to. For us, for a while, it was the cause of adoption. It consumed our commitment. Other people have other causes. Some people take on the cause of a particular disease. They want to find a cure for something like breast cancer or colon cancer or MS or HIV or some other tough disease. And so they hold fundraisers and they give speeches and they write articles trying to discover a cure for their particular disease. Their cause consumes their commitment. Some people have a cause that has to do with our brave soldiers they do everything they can to support our troops. They make care packages. They give to organizations that care for our warriors. It's their cause, and that cause consumes a lot of their commitment. You know, I was thinking about causes, and what I've come to realize is that causes usually include and involve two things. There are really two causes of the causes that we have. And the first cause of the causes that we take up has to do usually with a life circumstance. The causes that we have usually flow from a life circumstance that we have endured. Melody and I had the cause of adoption because we were in the midst of the adoption process. When somebody takes up the cause of finding a cure for a disease, it's usually because they've struggled through that disease themselves or they have a loved one who has struggled through that disease. When somebody takes up the cause of supporting the soldiers, supporting our troops, it's usually because they either have served in the military and we are very grateful for those folks who have served in the military or they have a family member who is risking life and limb for our country. Our causes tend to flow from the life circumstances that we endure. But then the second thing that our causes involve is they usually involve comebacks. And the idea behind comebacks is this. There are so many things that can affect our lives negatively. Sickness, it affects your health negatively. Sometimes it can even take your life if you cannot make it through. War, it can affect people negatively. It can take their lives. We have literally countless numbers of men and women who have given their lives in service to this country, and we want a way to come back from the negative. 
to take the pain, to take the hurts, to take the challenges of this world, and to turn them into positives. And that's why we take up causes. That's why everybody has a cause, because everybody has some sort of pain that has affected their lives profoundly. Now, here's the question that I want to consider today. There are lots of causes out there because there's lots of pain out there. The question that I want to consider today is which cause should be our primary cause? Which cause should be at the top of our list? Which cause should be number one? Which cause should consume our commitment more than any other cause in our life? Which cause is the greatest cause? Right now we're in this series, it's called Jesus, the Final Days. And the idea behind this series is very simply this. The gospel writers devote a third of their gospels to the final week of Jesus' life. Jesus lived on this earth 33 years. And so uh, 32 years and 51 weeks of Jesus' life, the gospel writers spend two-thirds of their gospels covering all of that. But then just one week, they spend a third of their gospels covering just one week of Jesus' life, which is the final week of Jesus' life. The gospel writers spend a lot of time talking about Jesus' final days. And if the gospel writers spend so much time talking about Jesus' final days, maybe we ought to take some time to study Jesus' final days. And that's what we're doing in this series. Because the fact of the matter is this. The final days of Jesus' life have huge implications for all of our lives. And so both in our weekend services and our midweek services, we're just walking step by step, moment through moment, day by day, through the final week of Jesus' life, from Palm Sunday, where he comes riding into Jerusalem, to Saturday, when he's lying there in a tomb. And we're just trying to figure out what we can learn from Jesus' final days for all of our days. And so this morning, as we continue through our series, we're going to be taking a look at Jesus' final cause. We all have causes that we take up in our lives that consume our commitments. Jesus has a cause that he takes up in his life that consumes his commitments. Now, just so you kind of get a lay of the land here, this episode that we're studying from Jesus' life takes place on Monday, which is the day after Palm Sunday, which is what we looked at last weekend when Jesus comes riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. And and I got to tell you, this episode that we're going to be taking a look at today is really one of the most startling stories from Jesus' life. Because what Jesus does on Monday is something that is really kind of almost out of character for the way that Jesus normally acts. He acts in a very unusual, almost offensive way. And so our text for today, Mark 11, beginning at verse 15. If you've got a Bible from the back of the room, it's going to be on page 717. Mark 11, beginning at verse 15. Mark opens by saying, on reaching Jerusalem. Now, right out of the gate, I want to pause right there. We talked about this last weekend. We talked about how by this point in time in Jesus' ministry, just the very word Jerusalem has kind of an ominous ring to it. Because Jerusalem is the place at which Jesus is going to be arrested, tried, mocked, beaten, crucified, and killed. And Jesus knows that the city of Jerusalem spells his doom. In fact, Jesus actually foretells that the city of Jerusalem is going to be the city that spells his doom. Matthew 20, verses 18 and 19, Jesus says, we're going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man is going to be betrayed to the chief priests and the teachers of the law. They'll condemn him to death. They'll turn him over to the Gentiles. He'll be mocked, flogged, and he will be crucified. He will die. Jesus knows the city of Jerusalem is the city at which he will die. And so Jesus knows exactly what's going to happen to him if he goes to Jerusalem. But it's kind of a funny thing because at the beginning of Mark 11, at the beginning of this chapter that we're looking at today, Jesus goes into Jerusalem once for Palm Sunday. 
Mark 11, verses 1 and 2, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, you'll find a colt that is tied there that nobody has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. And so the disciples bring the colt, and Jesus and his disciples, they go riding into Jerusalem. And you know what happens? They survive. Jesus doesn't die. In fact, at the beginning of the day, they go riding into Jerusalem. By the end of the day, they're coming out of Jerusalem. Mark 11, verse 11. Jesus entered Jerusalem, went to the temple. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. And so he gets out of Dodge. He gets to some place that is still not really friendly to him, but isn't quite as dangerous as Jerusalem. But now the very next morning, Mark 11, verse 15, you know where Jesus is heading back to? He's heading back to Jerusalem. He goes into Jerusalem, gets out of Jerusalem. He's a little bit safer in Bethany, but now the very next morning, he's going back to Jerusalem. Have you guys ever heard of the concept of tempting fate? Because that's really kind of what Jesus is doing here. You know, I grew up in the Pacific Northwest in Portland, Oregon, and one of the biggest stories ever to come out of that area was the eruption of Mount St. Helens, Sunday, May 18th, 1980. This is what Mount St. Helens looked like. That looks pretty devastating, doesn't it? The eruption was so catastrophic that a column of ash rose 80,000 feet into the air. That would be 15 miles high. It deposited ash in 11 states. It also blew a little bit over 1,300 feet off the top of the mountain. It was incredible. Now, right before the eruption, you know what Mount St. Helens looked like? It looked like this. A little bit different. In fact, what I really want you to notice is not so much the mountain there before the eruption. I want you to notice the lake right in front of the mountain. Uh, The lake is called Spirit Lake. It's still there. It's just about 150 feet higher now. But before the eruption at Mount St. Helens, there was a beautiful lake known as Spirit Lake, and people loved to go visit the lake. And on Spirit Lake, there was a lodge owner. His name was Harry Truman, not Harry S. Truman, the 33rd president of the United States. Harry R. Truman, lodge owner on Spirit Lake. And uh, Harry R. Truman was kind of a colorful man. Here's a picture of him. Uh, He lived in a lodge that he moved to in 1926. He had 16 cats. And before Mount St. Helens erupted, geologists knew that the mountain was cooking up something big. And so they started warning everybody to get out of that region. You know who refused to leave? Harry Truman. He wanted to stay at his lodge, stay at Spirit Lake, and stay with his 16 cats. And so even after everybody left, Harry Truman stayed. And people tried their best to get him out of there, but he just would not leave. In fact, the very night before Mount St. Helens erupted, a reporter came to interview Harry Truman, came to his lodge on Spirit Lake, and he tried to get Harry Truman to leave. Harry Truman said no. Even though he knew Spirit Lake at the base of Mount St. Helens was a very dangerous place to be. The next morning, Harry Truman, his lodge, his 16 cats were buried under 150 feet of volcanic debris. Harry Truman, he had every opportunity to get out of Dodge, but he didn't. Harry Truman tempted fate, and fate won. Jesus, he has every opportunity to get out of Jerusalem, but he doesn't. Jesus is tempting fate. The question is, is fate going to win? And so here, we're in Mark 11, and Jesus is going back into Jerusalem a second time after getting out with his life a first time. But what Jesus does once he gets back to Jerusalem is even more shocking than the fact that he goes to Jerusalem. And so Mark 11, beginning at verse 15 again, on reaching Jerusalem... Jesus entered the temple area and he began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves. And he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. You know, here is where this story gets really shocking because Jesus is going into a city that is hostile to him. And so you know how Jesus responds to a city that is hostile to him? He responds to a city that is hostile to him by being hostile to them. 
He goes to the temple in Jerusalem and he totally turns everything upside down. He disrupts the commerce. He disrupts everything that's going on there. And the reason this is kind of puzzling is because usually when we think of Jesus, do we think of him as someone who loses his cool or keeps his cool? We usually think of Jesus as someone who keeps his cool. There's this old hymn by Charles Wesley. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild, look upon a little child, pity my simplicity, suffer me to come to thee. That's the way that we usually think of Jesus. Gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Never loses his cool, never raises his voice, never gets upset. Heck, I mean, Jesus actually talks about the dangers of losing your cool, right? Matthew 5, verse 22. Anybody who's angry with his brother is going to be subject to judgment. And so this just kind of begs the question, if Jesus is normally so cool, calm, and collected, what gives here? What's going on at the temple that would upset Jesus this much that he would go into a dangerous place and just make it even more dangerous? That he would go into a place where people already do not like him and make people like him even less. What's going on? In order to understand Jesus' anger, you first need to understand a little bit about the temple in Jerusalem, and you also need to understand a little bit about the sacrificial system that kind of found its hearts at the temple in Jerusalem. And so, I want to begin by just giving you a little bit of background on the temple. Uh, The temple in Jerusalem in Jesus' day was really almost, it was kind of the third temple in Jerusalem. First temple in Jerusalem was built by a very famous king of Israel. Anybody know who he was? He was Solomon. And what's interesting about Solomon, who built the first temple in Jerusalem, is that the temple was actually kind of financed by Solomon's daddy, David. David led a capital campaign to get the materials that were needed to build the first temple in Jerusalem. And what David collects in his campaign is staggering. 1 Chronicles 22, verse 14, David says, I've taken great pains to provide for the temple of the Lord a hundred thousand talents of gold, a million talents of silver, quantities of bronze and iron too great to be weighed, and wood and stone. And, David says, you can keep on giving. You can add to them. Now, this is a lot of cash that David provides for the temple. In fact, let me just kind of give you a little window, a little insight into how much David raises for the building of the first temple in Jerusalem. He says he's going to raise 100,000 talents of gold. Now, in that day, a talent, just one talent, represented what the average day laborer would earn after, ready, 20 years of work. Just one talent. David raises 100,000 talents for the building of the temple of Jerusalem. And so if we do a little bit of math here, the median income in the U.S. for just one person right now is $24,062. You multiply that by 20, and you get a number of $481,240. And so you take that number, $481,240, and you multiply that by 100,000, and you wind up with a grand total of $48,124,000,000. That's how much David raises for the building of the temple in Jerusalem just in gold. That does not count the silver, the bronze, the iron, and all the other materials that he raises. Part of the reason the ancient Israelites loved the temple in Jerusalem so much, it wasn't just because it was the heart and center of Jewish worship, Jewish piety, and Jewish religion. It was because it was gorgeous. After all, if you put $48 billion worth of gold in some place, it's going to be pretty nice, don't you think? This was the grandeur and the glory of Solomon's temple. But then one day, disaster strikes. The Babylonians sweep into Jerusalem and they destroy the temple. They carry off all of its bounty, all $48 billion worth. They take the gold, they take the silver, they take the iron, they take the bronze, and the first temple is decimated, it is leveled, it is destroyed. And what was once Israel's pride and joy is now gone. And the Israelites themselves actually get deported to live in Babylon. This is part of the judgment of God because the Israelites refused to repent of their sin. Well, about 70 years later, the Jews are able to return to their homeland. 
And you want to know the first thing they want to do is they want to rebuild the temple. And so they decide that they're going to do another capital campaign and they're going to build a second temple. The problem is the second temple isn't nearly as glitzy and glamorous and glorious as the first because they don't have $48 billion worth of gold laying around somewhere after just getting back from exile in Babylon. You know, it's interesting, uh, when the second temple is built, there are certain people in Israel who, who remember the first temple. And Ezra 3 verse 12 says, when they're just starting to build the second temple, when all they've laid is the foundation, it says many of the older priests and Levites and family heads who had seen the former temple wept aloud when they saw the foundation of the second temple being laid, not because they were happy, but because they were sad. They knew that the second temple could not hold a candle to the first temple because the second temple had so fewer resources than the first temple did. But all of that changed in the year 20 B.C. There was a guy who was reigning over Israel at this time named Herod the Great. And Herod the Great essentially begins work in that year on what might be called a third temple. And really, uh, the third temple was just kind of a radical remodeling of the second temple in Jerusalem. Herod put in a lot of cash, a lot of elbow grease, and a lot of work to radically remodel and expand the second temple in Jerusalem to kind of bring it back to its former glory. I can remember when I was a kid, we used to go to a mall called Jansen Beach. And back in the 20s, Jansen Beach actually was an amusement park. Had all sorts of rides and games. Uh, in, in 1972, that was leveled, and they built a mall. Now, by the late 80s, Jansen Beach was beginning to look kind of dated. And so you know what they did to it? They remodeled it. In fact, they not only remodeled it, they radically remodeled it. They expanded it. They made it look good. They made it look real, up to date. Here's a picture of Jansen Beach. You gotta love that pastel color scheme from the late 80s and early 90s. It's just beautiful. And it was interesting, after a while, it was called Jansen Beach Center, but the mall got to be so big and so influential that they renamed it. And rather than calling it Jansen Beach Center, they began to call it Jansen Beach Super Center. Because it wasn't just a normal mall, it was a super mall. It wasn't just a normal center, it was a super center. When Herod remodels the temple in Jerusalem, he takes it from being a temple to a super temple. He takes it from being a center of religious worship to a super center of religious worship. Let me just kind of give you a little bit of insight into the grandiosity of the temple that Herod remodeled so that you understand the work that went into this. First off, Herod began his refurbishing project in the year 20 B.C. You know when he finished it? It was finally finished in the year 66 A.D. You do the math there and you get 86 years. That's how long this refurbishing project took. He brought in architects from Greece, Rome, and Egypt, all the best from all over the world to make sure that he could get the best product possible. Because the temple was built on Mount Moriah, and we'll come back to Mount Moriah here in just a little bit, Mount Moriah had a steep decline from its northern slope to its southern slope. And Herod actually wanted to straighten out that decline. And so what he did was he got all of these stones and he hauled them up the mountain. The largest stone weighs 628 tons. And he turned the top of the mountain into a plateau. That way, he could straighten out the temple and make everything look just pristine, and he also had plenty of room to expand the temple. The temple consisted of four divisions, the first and largest of which was the court of the Gentiles. The court of the Gentiles was 500 yards long by 325 yards wide, think 33 acres worth of size. And the court of the Gentiles had these massive columns that decorated its perimeter. Jewish historian Josephus actually writes about these columns. He says, the pillars stood in four rows, one over against the other all along, for the fourth row was interwoven into the wall, and the thickness of each pillar was such that three men might, with their arms extended, fathom it round, and join their hands again 
While its length was 27 feet with a double spiral at its basis and the number of all the pillars in that court was 162. Here's what Josephus is saying. These columns were so big, they were so fat around that the only way you could actually get around one column, just one column, is if you took three guys, extended their arms, had them join hands, and they would be able to reach their hands all the way around the column. That's how big these columns were, and there were 162 of them, Josephus says. This was the super temple that King Herod built. And it was impressive, it was breathtaking. In fact, the only thing that was really more impressive than the temple itself was the sacrificial system that took place at the temple. You know, the sacrificial system actually finds its origins in the very first Jewish man to ever make a sacrifice. You know who that was? Abraham. Remember the sacrifice that God calls Abraham to make? He says to Abraham, Abraham, I want you to go and I want you to sacrifice your son. Your son Isaac, whom you love. Now, it's interesting where Abraham makes that sacrifice. Genesis 22, beginning at verse 1. Sometime later, God tested Abraham. He said to him, Abraham, Abraham responded, here I am. Then God said, take your son, your only son Isaac, whom you love, and go to the region of Moriah. Sacrifice him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains I'm going to tell you about. And so God says to Abraham, here's what I want you to do. I want you to make a sacrifice on Mount Moriah. Remember where they built the temple? On Mount Moriah. The first Jewish sacrifice is where all the Jewish sacrifices took place. And so, for the Israelites and for the Jews, making sacrifices was a very big deal. When the temple that Solomon built was first dedicated, 2 Chronicles 7 verse 5 says that King Solomon offered a sacrifice of 22,000 head of cattle and 120,000 sheep and goats. Think about that. 120,000 sheep and goats, 22,000 head of cattle. That's a lot of steak. All in one dedication ceremony. Another quote from Josephus. When the temple was finally finished in the year 66 AD, they held a big ceremony. And Josephus says the number of sacrifices was 256,500. It's a lot of sacrifices. Making sacrifices at the temple was a big deal. Now, you also need to know that making sacrifices at the temple was big business, too. When it came to making sacrifices at the temple, the standard protocol and practice was that you would bring something from your home, a lamb, a goat, a pigeon, something from your home. You would take it to the temple in Jerusalem, and you would sacrifice it there at the temple in Jerusalem. Leviticus 23, verses 17 and 18 God says, from wherever you live, bring a burnt offering to the Lord, an aroma that is pleasing to the Lord. And so you bring your sheep, you bring your goat, you carry it to the temple in Jerusalem, and you sacrifice it to God at the temple in Jerusalem. Here was the problem. Some people lived a real long ways away from the temple in Jerusalem. And so, Old Testament law makes an exception if you happen to live really far away from the temple and you can't really carry a lamb a hundred miles to go to the temple. Deuteronomy 14, verse 24. If the place is too distant for you and you cannot carry your tithe there because the place where the Lord your God is going to choose to put his name is so far away, then exchange your tithe for silver. Take the silver with you. Go to the place the Lord your God will choose. Use the silver to buy whatever you like, cattle, sheep, wine, or other fermented drink, anything you wish, and that can be your offering. That can be your sacrifice. And so God says, if you live too far away, that's okay. Just take some money, go to the temple in Jerusalem, and you'll be able to buy a sacrifice there. Now, there was a catch in first century Israel. If you were to buy your sacrifice at the temple, you could only buy your sacrifice at the temple using Hebrew currency. It was called a shekel. Here's the problem. Israel was occupied by, anybody remember what empire occupied the Israelites these days? The Romans. Now, did Roman people use Hebrew currency, yes or no? 
No. Most of the commerce, even in Israel in this day, was done by Romans. And so you needed to use Roman currency. And so for day-to-day commerce, you wouldn't have shekels. You would have Roman coins. You wouldn't have Hebrew coins. You would have Roman money. And and so if you wanted to go to the temple, buy a lamb, buy something else to sacrifice there, you had to use Hebrew currency, but nobody had it. Everybody had Roman currency, but that's okay because at the temple, they had these tables that were full of what they called money changers. And you could go to the temple and you could take your Roman coins and you could give them to the money changers and they would change them out for the Hebrew coins. And also right there at the temple, then you could take your Hebrew coins and you could go and you could buy your lamb, you could buy your cow, you could buy your whatever and take it to be sacrificed. And so the temple was kind of a one-stop shop. You could get your money exchanged, you could buy your sacrifice, you could make your sacrifice all right there at the temple in Jerusalem. It was super convenient. You know, I don't do this very often, but every once in a while when I travel internationally, one of the things that I always notice right there at the airports, pretty much as soon as I land, are currency exchange booths. They're pretty much at the major international terminals of any airport. And it's interesting because the exchange rates at these booths are usually not all that great. If you go and you find a currency exchange store somewhere else in the city that you've landed at, the rates are usually quite a bit better. But at the airport, they know. It's convenient. It's fast. International travelers want to exchange their money quick. And so sometimes they're willing to kind of pay a premium in the exchange rate for the convenience of exchanging it right there at the airport. Now, think about this. Right there on the temple grounds, there are essentially all of these currency exchange booths, these tables that are full of money changers. You can bring your Roman money, exchange it for Hebrew money. It's convenient. It's quick. How good do you think the exchange rate is? Not so good. In fact, it's less than not so good. It is abysmal. The money changers who worked at the temple were well known for fleecing people. They wouldn't give people a reasonable rate. They would give people an awful rate. They'd practically lose the shirt off their back just exchanging their coins from Roman currency to Hebrew currency. Not only that, if you buy an animal at the temple, do you think you got a real good price on that animal or do you think you kind of got a premium price on that animal? You got a premium price. It's kind of like buying a sandwich at the airport. It costs you at least 20 bucks, right? That's what's going to happen when you try to go buy an animal at the temple. And so if you go to the temple and you can't bring your own lamb, your own cow, you're going to get dinged twice. Once by the money changers who are charging you a lousy rate to have your Roman currency exchanged to Hebrew currency and a second time by those who are selling sheep and doves and, and cows and goats and other sacrificial animals at the temple. And so here's basically what happened. The temple became a place for a lot of vendors to make a lot of money. A place of worship basically turned into a money-making scheme. Turned into a giant mall. Now it's interesting because when Jesus sees this, he's not happy about this. And so verse 15 says that Jesus overturns the tables of the money changers. The word for tables here is the word trapeza in Greek. We get our English word trapeze from this, like at a circus. That's really what the temple was. It was a circus. And Jesus is having none of it. And so he overturns the tables of the money changers, the benches of those who are selling doves, And verse 16 says, he does not allow anybody to carry merchandise through the temple courts. You know, one of the things that I do a lot of around the house these days is pick it up. We got two cats, a dog, and a daughter, and things get messy really quickly when you have that kind of household. So there are always dishes to be washed. There are always litter boxes to be scooped. There are always carpets to be vacuumed. There are always counters to be cleaned. There's always plenty to do. And so Melody and I have kind of adopted the divide and conquer approach. She takes part of the house, I take another part of the house, and we go and we try to clean up as much as we can at the end of the day. But sometimes, even when we're both working on it, it'll take like better than an hour just to put the house back in a reasonably ordered condition. It takes a long time to clean a house. Here's Jesus. Now, you know what Jesus has come to the temple to do? He's come to the temple to clean the temple. 
Now, when you think about the size of the temple that Jesus has to clean, you begin to realize just how astonishing his cleaning capabilities really are. Just the court of the Gentiles, as I said, was 33 acres, and it was packed with money changers and vendors. It would have been packed with thousands of people, which means that Jesus is throwing out literally hundreds, if not thousands of people, just out of one court of the temple. He does it all by itself. Jesus has the power, the strength, the stamina, the authority, the dominance to do what nobody else in his day would have been able to do. Remember what Samson did to the temple? That ain't nothing compared to what Jesus does to the temple in Mark 11. Move over, Samson, because Jesus' strength has you beat. It's incredible. Jesus has supernatural strength to clean up a messy situation. But with all that being said, there's still one big question that's kind of lingering over the story, and this is the question of why. Why would Jesus bring down the temple like this? Mark 11, verse 17. After Jesus cleans the temple, he teaches those who are left in the temple. He says, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it into a den of robbers. The problem with what was going on at the temple is that the Jews traded the prayer of the temple for commerce in the temple. They were more concerned with turning a buck than with worshiping the Lord. And this upsets Jesus, and so he says, Isaiah 56, verse 7, he cites the verse, my house will be called a house of prayer. And then Jesus adds this little line, for all nations. Now, what's interesting about this line, for all nations, is that this is the exact opposite of what most Jews expected the Messiah to do in the first century. Most Jews expected the Messiah in the first century not to turn the temple into a house of prayer for all nations, but to turn the temple into a house of prayer for the Jewish nation. In fact, one of the expectations that Jews had in the first century of the Messiah was that the Messiah was actually going to drive out everybody who was not Jewish from the temple. The Messiah was actually going to get rid of the court of the Gentiles. There's a book called the Psalms of Solomon. It's from the second century B.C. And it says this about the Messiah. It says, Behold, O Lord, raise up unto them a king and gird him with strength that he may shatter unrighteous rulers, that he may purge Jerusalem from nations that trample her down to destruction. This is what most Jews expected the Messiah, their king, to do. He expected them to come and drive out the nations. Jesus says, no, 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 I want to bring in the nations. My house is going to be called the house of prayer for all nations. Jesus takes their expectations and he turns them on their head. In fact, Jesus does more than that. He actually takes the temple and he turns it on its head. And this is a big deal because if you remember, the heart and soul of Jewish faith, Jewish piety, Jewish religion was the temple. If you wanted to go to God, communicate with God, commune with God, receive forgiveness from God, you know where you had to go? You had to go to the temple. The temple was the heart and soul of the Jewish faith. But then Jesus comes along and he cleanses the temple. And when he cleanses the temple, here's what he's really saying. He's saying, you know that temple that you think is really important? It's not that big of a deal. In fact, what Jesus does in Mark 11 is only the beginning. Jesus says, you know what? It's actually going to get worse for the temple. I've just started the deal. Don't worry, the deal will be finished. Mark 13, verse 2, Jesus talks to his disciples and he says, do you see all these great buildings? Jesus is talking about the temple. Not one stone here will be left on another. Every single one is going to be thrown down. And it happens. A couple of decades after Jesus dies. In fact, the temple's finished in 66 AD. It's destroyed in 70 AD. Roman general named Titus comes marching into Jerusalem. He's trying to squelch and squash a a Jewish rebellion. And so you know what he does? He squelches and squashes the Jewish rebellion by destroying the 
temple. 1.1 million people die when Titus comes into Jerusalem, knocks over the temple. In fact, there's only one part of the temple that still remains standing. It remains standing to this day. It's a wall. You know what it's called? The Wailing Wall. Because even to this day, the destruction was so terrible, it causes people to cry. You know, a lot of times, people will express a desire to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And they usually uh, connect the rebuilding of the temple to the second coming in Christ. But here's what you need to understand about Jesus' actions and words in Mark 11. When Jesus comes in and overturns the tables at the temple, Jesus is making a declaration. And the declaration is this. You don't need a temple because you got me. I am the new temple. You know, the same story in the Gospel of John. John chapter 2. In the temple courts... Jesus found men selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. So he made a whip out of cords. He drove all from the temple area, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers, and he overturned their tables. Now the Jews aren't happy about this, and so the Jews say to him in verse 18, what miraculous sign can you show us to prove your authority to do this? Jesus says, destroy this temple. And I'll raise it again in three days. The Jews replied, it's taken 46 years to build the temple. And you're going to raise it in three days? And then I love what John says next. Verse 21. But the temple he had spoken of was the temple of his body. According to John 2, who's the new temple? Jesus is the new temple. And as long as you have Jesus, you don't need a temple because you already got the greatest temple. John has this amazing vision in Revelation. Revelation 21, verse 22, where he sees the new city, Jerusalem. And he says, I did not see a temple in the city. Why? Because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. You don't need a temple when you got Jesus. Even Solomon, when he builds the first temple, he knows something about the temple. The temple's only temporary. Solomon, when he prays his prayer of dedication... Over the temple in Jerusalem, 1 Kings 8, verse 27, he asks, but will God really dwell on earth? The heavens, even the highest heaven, cannot contain you. How much less this temple I have built. Solomon knows that a temple, even a temple with billions of dollars worth of gold in it, it may be grand, but it's not quite good enough for God. There's no house built by human hands that is suitable for the Lord. So what house is suitable for the Lord? I'll tell you a house that's suitable for the Lord. A house that's called a manger. A house that is a dusty Palestinian countryside. A house that is a cross. A house that is a savior named Jesus. This is Jesus' message. He comes into the temple. He overturns the temple because you know what? As long as you have Jesus, you know what you don't need? You don't need a temple. You got the greatest temple there has ever been. Now, when you think about it, for Jews who were living in the first century, that's kind of a radical paradigm shift, right? Because if you're a Jew living in the first century, you know what you're all about. You're all about the temple. You're all about the sacrifices. Jesus comes along and he says, you don't need a temple, I'm the temple. You don't need sacrifices, I am the sacrifice. You need me, not the temple, not the sacrifices. You need me. And so it's not surprising that some people are a little, well, put off by Jesus' actions. Mark 11, verse 18, the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and they began looking for a way to kill Jesus. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. The religious leaders, when they see what Jesus has done to the temple, they're mad. They want to kill Jesus. Kind of interesting, though. The crowds don't want to kill Jesus. They're amazed at Jesus. Verse 18 says they're amazed at his teaching. A quick note on the Greek here. The Greek word for amazed is ek pleso, made up of two words. Pleso, which means to hit or to strike, and ek, which is a preposition that means out. And so, to ek pleso literally means to strike out. Now, this word, ek pleso, this word that means to strike out, it's interesting because it's kind of a neutral word. 
It doesn't mean that the crowds believe Jesus, but it doesn't mean they reject Jesus either. They're just kind of waiting to see whether or not he will strike out. They're kind of on the fence with Jesus. You know, one of the things that my nephews Noah and Nicholas do is they play Little League in the spring. And we go and we sit in the stands as a family and we yell and shout and scream and make fools out of ourselves. It's kind of a good time as a family. And it's fun for the boys too. They have a great time with it, but honestly, it's a little nerve-wracking for parents and relatives and friends because every parent, relative, or friend always wants their kid to do well. And so whenever Noah and Nicholas come up to bat, they always kind of get a chorus line from the family, okay? Come on, you can do it. Keep your eye on the ball. Don't swing too early. Don't swing too late. Don't swing too low. Don't swing too high. Pick your ball. Why? Because you want them to hit the ball, right? You don't want them to strike out. Because striking out is bad. Well, it's bad in baseball, it's a funny thing, right? Strike it out in baseball is really bad. Strike it out in bowling is really good. In bowling, you want to strike out. In baseball, you don't want to strike out. You know, Mark 11, verse 18 says that the crowds are amazed that Jesus is going to act pluso. He's going to strike out. Really, the question of this day in this story is how is Jesus going to strike out? Is it going to be like a strikeout in baseball or is it going to be like a strikeout in bowling? Is it going to be a bad strikeout or is it going to be a good strikeout? Is it going to be a losing strikeout or is it going to be a victorious strikeout? The good news of the gospel is that Jesus strikes out in the best way possible because he doesn't strike out of a baseball field and he doesn't strike out with some pins. He strikes out of a tomb. And that's why rather than a temple, we have a Savior. That's why rather than making sacrifices, we have a sacrifice. Because everything that Jesus does Monday in the temple in Jerusalem, he vindicates Friday on the cross outside of Jerusalem. In fact, I was thinking about this. When Jesus overturns the temple, he does have a cause. You know what the cause is? The cause is you. That's why he cleanses the temple. That's why he overturns the temple because he knows that the people don't need that temple. The people need his temple, the temple that is his body. His cause is you. But it's more than that. It's not just that you are his cause. It's that Jesus is the cause of hope and life and joy and peace and salvation. And that means that if you are Jesus' cause and Jesus causes salvation for you, you know what your number one cause should be? Jesus. He's who you need. He's who your eternity hangs on. He's your temple. And so, here's my encouragement to you, my brothers and sisters. Don't just worship at the temple. Worship the temple. Because he is the greatest temple there ever was, and he is the temple that you need. Because he is the temple who saves. And so with that, let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. And we thank you that the temple of his body is so much greater than any temple that could ever be built by human hands. The temple of his body is the temple that not only died but rose for us. And so, Father, may we not only worship at the temple of your son, Jesus Christ, may we worship him as the temple, the temple that leads to our salvation, the temple that gives us hope, and the temple that gives us eternity.
We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great week, guys. Walk with the light.